extraordinary. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for welcoming me here today. For those of us who are involved in arts and culture, particularly funding arts and culture, we've spent a good deal of our time in the last four or five years articulating why we should fund arts and culture. What are its benefits? And you have to do that more and more in tough times. And uh, we have taken to, at least at the Arts Council, sharing with our colleagues across arts and culture, putting together a series of arguments which might be for government, but they might be for trusts and foundations, they might be for individuals, about why arts and culture deliver benefits to society. And we came up with four sort of headings, and I'm not going to talk about them today, but I'm going to dive into one of them. Intrinsic, the philosophy of it. What it it's about our identity. It's about our quality of life. Society, the benefits to society across many, many parts of society. Education is the third, and benefits to the economy is the, is the fourth. So just taking that word intrinsic, there's one sort of word or phrase there we came up with called empathetic citizens. And that's what I want to talk about today. Now, how many people here have read The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime? Good, you've done your homework then. That's excellent, even without being told. So you'll remember in that book, it's about <clears throat> a boy who's somewhere on the autistic spectrum, probably Asperger's, it's not particularly defined. And you may remember one sequence in the book where the boy Christopher is being talked to by his teacher at school, a special needs teacher, and she gives him a tube of Smarties. And she says to him, Christopher, what is in that tube? And he says, Smarties. And she says, open it. And he opens it. And he finds inside several pencils, not smarties. And then she says to him, Christopher, if I said to your mother, I gave the tube to your mother and I said to your mother, what's in the tube? What would your mother say? And his answer is pencils. But of course, he should have said smarties. Because this boy cannot think himself into somebody else's feelings. He doesn't have the power of empathy. He doesn't, can't put himself in somebody else's shoes. And the power of empathy, which is in fact the social glue that makes our society function, I'm going to argue today is something very much that arts and culture does in a number of ways. Now, Adam Smith, the economist, was very interested in why societies functioned and why people cooperated. Charles Darwin, who we heard about this morning, was equally interested in why people did. But a, um, a German philosopher, Theodore Lips, about 1900, was particularly interested in why, when we watch somebody on a tightrope, doing a tightrope act, we are scared shitless. What is that about? That is the power of empathy. That is us imagining ourselves in their shoes. Now, if Theodore Lips had read more British literature, he would have known that George Eliot, some 60 years earlier, said, the greatest benefit we owe the artist, whether painter, poet, or novelist, is the extension of our sympathies. Art is the nearest thing to life. It's a mode of amplifying experience and extending our contact with our fellow men beyond the bounds of our personal lot. Just think about it as the function of art in society. In fact, let's stick with the 19th century for a moment and think about two books in the 19th century. The best-selling book in America, after the Bible in the 19th century. Anybody know? Correct, yes, thank you. It was Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> Uncle Tom's Cabin, which some would find an excessively sentimental book, nevertheless was credited with being one of the things that allowed Lincoln to fight the, sec uh, the, to fight the American Civil War and help him abolish slavery. And it is a book that persuaded enough citizens in America that black people were not objects, but were people, were human beings. And it was an immensely influential book in the 19th century. And here, in the United Kingdom in the 19th century, Water Babies, The Water Babies by Charles Kingsley. Not much read today. Anybody read that one? Oh, I'm very impressed. That's excellent. Well, you'll know that book, which is a sort of allegory and a rather, and a fantasy, is actually a book attacking child slavery. And you'll know that in the reforming governments of Disraeli and Gladstone that followed the publication of the book, various factory acts were passed against child labor. And the water babies had a lot to do with that. There were two works of literature in the 19th century that had massive social effect. 
And they did it because in both cases, they got us to look at human beings as human beings and to empathize with them. Now, I want to say a word to now about science, the science of empathy. Because what's so interesting at the moment is that two fields of science are rapidly progressing a much greater understanding of what this human instinct for empathy is. The first is evolutionary biology. In particular, a, a, a guy called Franz de Waal, a Dutchman who, who actually teaches and studies in America. Enormous amount of work with apes and monkeys and dolphins and elephants. And these are species that also have the power of empathy. They know when another animal is in trouble. They can comfort animals that are in trouble. They know, mothers know how to nurture their children. And Franz de Waal argues that probably language itself is an act of empathy. It's an act of communication and it enables empathy. And of course, it is language and indeed painting and the visual arts, of course, that allow us to express the human condition. And as we heard actually from the reverend professor before lunch, um, we heard from him about the power of narrative. And what is the power of narrative is, is if it is not about the human condition and about empathy? Now, that's the first field of science. The second field of science is neuroscience. In the early 1990s, a very clever neuroscientist in Italy called Rizzolatti, which sounds like something you might buy from Starbucks, Rizzolatti, but in fact is his name. He was doing experiments with macaque monkeys. And he was looking at the way their neurons worked. And he saw the part of their brain where the neurons lit up when they reached for a peanut, when they were about to reach for a peanut and eat it. And one day, by accident, he had the monkeys wired up when a researcher reached for the peanut in front of the monkey to eat the peanut. And the same area of the brain lit up. And he had a great insight, which he spent the next 10 years working on, which was the invention of mirror neurons. And mirror neurons are the part of our brain that enable us to empathize. And therefore, they lie at the root, actually, of much of arts practition, uh, the practition of, of, of much of arts and culture. Um, and the extraordinary thing about mirror neurons, and they're going back to our friend Theodore that we talked about earlier, the man on the tightrope, they're not just what make you put yourself into somebody else's shoes and make you identify with somebody else's situation because the same part of your brain is imagining that you are on that tightrope or that you're reaching for that peanut. But in the case of arts and culture, you can sit in a seat watching a play on a stage. You know it's not true, but you empathize with it. It tells you things about the human condition and those same parts of your brain light up. So mirror neurons work not only when you're seeing something real that isn't happening to you and you imagine how that is to someone else, they happen even when it is imaginary, the situation you're watching, still the mirror neurons work. Now, empathy is one thing, but Ken Robinson, who many of you will know from his famous TED talk, said, empathy comes from the power of imagination, compassion is applied empathy. It's one thing to empathize, something else to do something about it. Compassion is the cultural glue that holds us together as communities. I'd like you to consider the case of Iago for a moment. You could argue that Iago is incredibly empathetic. He perfectly understands other people. He can play Othello like a fiddle. He can manipulate him, but he doesn't have compassion. In fact, he has the exact opposite of compassion. He wreaks havoc and diabolical havoc because of how clever he is. And that, of course, is the actions of a psychopath. They have brilliant understanding of other people, but they don't have compassion. That's the bit they lack. And across popular culture, not just arts and culture uh, that may be funded by, say, the Arts Council, across all popular culture, if you take the soap operas on television, they are about the human condition. They encourage us to see other people and see other people's predicaments. They are, in fact, the empathy, the glue that binds society. And indeed, if you would consider for a moment the simple act of a parent reading a bedtime story to a child, reading a piece of fiction to a child, that is, of course, an act of compassion. It is a bonding act, but it's more than that. Small children get to ex exercise their empathetic muscles, their imagination, their mirror neurons in that 
very activity. And now imagine small children who never have bedtime stories read to them, who never develop that empathetic muscle. I think we can see how powerful empathy is and how it connects and is delivered by arts and culture. So a cognitive psychologist who's also a novelist, scientist and an artist, said the process of entering imagined worlds of fiction builds empathy and improves your ability to take another person's point of view. That's Keith Oakley. And I just want you, am I all right for a second or two, Stephanie? Mm, yeah. Good, you'll scream when I'm not, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, I see, yes, a clock. Good, <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. Wonders of science, four minutes 50, uh, 49, oh, 48, sorry. Um, I just want you to consider for a moment uh, a play that actually was funded by the Arts Council called Red Velvet that was performed, many of you will have seen Red Velvet at the Tricycle Theatre in the last five years. Very powerful play commissioned by Indu Rabassingham, who's the artistic director at the Tricycle, who also directed the play. She discovered the story of the black actor Ira Aldridge, who came to the United Kingdom from America in the 1820s. And he had bit parts on the stage, uh, Covent Garden and other places. And the great Shakespearean actor Edmund Keane was ill. He was playing Othello, but he was ill, so they needed to find another Othello. And so the actor manager of the production asked Ira Aldridge, a black man, to play a black part. And he started performing in it. And after about five days, the public were outraged at this. And they complained so furiously, Ira Aldridge was sacked from the production of Othello. And the play ends with the character of Aldridge putting on white makeup, because wearing white makeup is the only way in which he can get a part in a play. And Indu says that theater in general, and that play specifically, is all about getting the audience to put themselves in someone else's shoes, the exercise of empathy. And uh, I think she, she, she puts that very powerfully and says quite clearly what her intention is. One other story, I'm currently um, chair of something called the United Kingdom Holocaust Memorial Foundation. One of my fellow council members is here with me today. And our, we're charged by the government to come up with a new memorial for the Holocaust in London with a learning center. And we're charged to have a vision for education of the Holocaust in the next 70 years after the survivors, who are all very old, who go around schools, are dead. And uh, there's an amazing museum some of you may have been to called the National Holocaust Center near Newark in Nottinghamshire in the middle of the countryside. And there they've put together a small exhibition which you walk through the different rooms, which are in, rooms in the life of a small boy in Germany in the early 1930s. And you see that boy gradually become ostracized at school. You see his experience through Kristallnacht and eventually you see him become one of the kinder transport, join the kinder transport to, to the United Kingdom. They've taken that program out of that museum into schools in Nottinghamshire, in communities, where there's a high level of immigration and a high level of racism. And the research that comes back from that is incredible, from that small piece of art, of drama, of that, about that little boy's life. Because the people who watch it say to themselves, and they say out loud to each other, I realize that people who are different from me are actually the same as me. And that in itself is an act of empathy too. And so it shows you how Keith Oakley's words are really quite profound. So I just want to end, I started with George Eliot, I'm gonna end with Tolstoy, who said something similar to what George Eliot said. The task for art is to accomplish sorry, the task for art to accomplish is to make that feeling of brotherhood and love of one's neighbor, now attained only by the best members of society, the customary feeling and instinct of all men. And so it's interesting, isn't it, that before evolutionary biology and before neuroscience became sophisticated enough to begin to explain to us what our origins are as a species, why we cooperate, and how our brains function to enable us to do it, long before that, Artists had worked out what the function of art was, what the function of imagination was, and what the function of empathy is. You could say culture is empathy, and you could say culture promotes empathy. I think that's 
pretty important, and it's a pretty good reason for supporting arts and culture. Now, we were given very strict instructions today to um, talk about light, and I haven't talked about light at all, though I hope you have found what I've said mildly illuminating. <laughs> However, as the clock counts down from 15 to 14 seconds, I just want to say I was true to my word, and there is a picture of some light. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.